have a program for them, and so uh, head back there and uh, they'll be able to uh, minister to the kids. Um, while they're going back, just uh, just a couple things. Um, uh, Joe, stand up so that way Pastor Russ can't say let's know who you are anymore. Okay, he knows who you are. Um, the um, uh, remember remember his sister. Uh, part of the struggle with the surgery coming up is that she has COVID-19 right now. And, and she had a prior surgery before that, so she's getting over the surgery with COVID and then, you know, having another surgery. She's looking forward to. And uh, this, is, uh, this is quite serious, so uh, remember her in your prayers. I know, uh, I know you, he would appreciate it. Um, you know, and uh, we have a couple of visitors with us. I'm not going to have you all stand up, but it's good to have uh, it's good to have uh, Herb's uh, Herb's family with with him today. And uh, welcome. And we have a young man in the back, Kevin. Uh, he's visiting today, and so uh, Kevin, uh, pray for uh, pray for Kevin. He shared with me earlier today that uh, Satan's really attacking, and um, that, you know he uh, he just uh, wants to get find his uh, his footing and his, his his strength in the Lord. And uh, that's where we do find it, and uh, we give God, uh, God, you know, the glory, and that's what that's what it's all about, isn't it? Is allowing God to have His way in our lives. And uh, today we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about giving thanks with a grateful heart. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of passages in Scripture I can turn to uh, to talk about thanksgiving, to giving God God the praise and God the glory. Um, but the the passage that uh, the Lord led me to. Uh, then I told my wife she she's asked she's already asking me what my Christmas messages are all going to be about and uh, you know she wants to prepare the music and it's like you know dear let me get through Thanksgiving first you know uh, I, I get frustrated when I go into the stores uh, you know before Halloween and the Christmas stuff is already up I, I it just bothers me get through one one at a time you know uh, but um, um, you know she uh, as uh, as, I, as I I shared with her that the Lord had given me a uh, at least I thought the Lord had given me a passage, and I was studying that passage, and then all of a sudden he changed it, and um, he directed me to Psalm 100. And uh, I'm going to ask you to go to Psalm 100 today. Uh, Psalm 100 is one of those um, one of those psalms which I've preached on before, um, and and most likely you've heard a message on it before as well. Um, it's not a real long psalm, and I think people like it because it's only five verses. It's not like Psalm 119. Okay, 172 verses. Okay, you can memorize Psalm 100. Um, have fun memorizing Psalm 119. Okay, but uh, but Psalm 100, as the Lord led it upon my heart, it's interesting that this is the end of a series of psalms about the future kingdom. Okay, what kingdom are we talking about? We're talking about the millennial kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom when Jesus Christ will come and He will set up His kingdom here on earth. And I believe that the timetable for us as Christians, the next thing on God's timetable, is for us to be raptured. We as a church who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior will be raptured. Okay, that's what we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Um, that we will be raptured. Um, that during that time, as we go, uh, when we go up, we'll meet the Lord in the air, we'll fellowship with Him. Okay, but there will be a seven year period of time that this earth will go through um, judgment. Okay, it's called the great the, the tribulation or the great tribulation, however you want to look at it, for seven years. At the end of that seven year period of time, Jesus Christ comes back again, and he comes back with us as his saints to rule here on earth. And we as the saints will rule here on earth, those who have made it through the tribulation period. Okay? Those who make it through the tribulation period, don't take the mark of the beast. Don't, uh, don't, you know, uh, but, but rely solely on God, rely solely on Him, and live through that tribulation period, are going to come out of it, they're going to live here on earth for a thousand years. And, and families are going to have children, and the, the world is going to multiply, and, the, uh, the, you, know, the, and you know, it, will, go, it you know, will, will grow, sort of like after the flood, remember Noah was, was told, you know, be fruitful, multiply, and it's going to happen during that period of time with one exception or difference than what it happened to know is that Jesus Christ will be reigning on high. And I believe that is exactly what Philippians chapter 2 in verses 9 through 11 talks about. It says, therefore God has also highly exalted him, talking about Jesus Christ, 
And the verses before this talk about how Jesus Christ took on humanity to die on Calvary's tree, to die for you and for me, for our sins. He took that curse upon himself. He took on our sin that we might have his righteousness. Okay, is what the Bible teaches. And it says that, that as Jesus did that, God himself has highly exalted Christ and given Christ the name which is above every name. And then the next verse says this. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me ask you something. Has this happened yet? No. I mean, walk around this. You know, go into Philadelphia this afternoon. Walk around and tell me how many people are glorifying God. They're not. Okay? This is talking about a time that is to come. That is where we're at here in this psalm. Okay? This psalm is a psalm that gives glory to God, that worships, worships God. I believe that we can learn some things through Psalm 1. Okay? And I believe that in Psalm 1 we can learn some principles or some things that we need to have if we're going to worship God. You know, the Bible, uh, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, the Bible tells us this. Not forsaking the assemblies of yourselves together. So here I believe the author of Hebrews is writing to the church and he's saying to the church, listen, don't forget to assemble together. Why are we assembling together? To worship God. We're here to worship God. We're here to give God the glory. We're here to give God the praise. Listen, can I say something this morning and I don't want anybody being offended, but can I say this to you? You're not here today so you can leave here feeling good. Right. It's not why you're here. You're here to give glory to God. Amen. That's why we come to worship. Amen. Now there's a second reason in this text why we come to glorify you. Or why we come to worship. Notice what it says. It says, not forsaking the assemblies of yourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. The other reason why we come is so I can exhort you or I can encourage you and it, and it goes on, it says, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Okay, you need the encouragement to make it through this coming week. And how can you be encouraged to do that? Not just by worshiping God, but also by having us, your church family, get behind you or get, get with you, hold your arms up and encourage you day by day. I praise the Lord for the testimonies we had this morning. I mean, how many, how, many, how many months and how many, maybe I should say even years, were we praying for Lisa for a job? I know our RU program was. God answered that. And, and Lisa can be assured that the RU program, the ones that she got close to coming out to RU, are still praying for her. But isn't that true in, in all of us, for all of us? We ought to be assured that, you know, that person who normally sits next to you, have you did, did you notice that there's maybe somebody missing next to you that usually sits there? Or the person in front of you that's missing, that, you know, they should know that, they're praying, that we're praying for them. Okay? That's what we're told, that that part of this fellowship together is so not we can worship God, but we can also exhort one another. And so this morning, I want us to take Psalm 100, and I want us to uh, talk about worshiping God, and, and what are some things we need to have if we're going to worship God for, properly. And I really believe in Psalm 100, we see that. So let's open with a word of prayer, and then we're going to go real quick through this outline, um, and through this text, these five verses. Let's pray. Father, uh, just teach us this morning. Lord, we want to come into your house with the right heart attitude. We want to come into your house and worship you properly. Lord, it's not about us. It's not about us feeling good. It's not about us, you know, hey, I have it our way. But it's, Lord, it's coming before your face and giving you the praise and the glory for what you have done. And so, Lord, you minister to us, I do pray. Challenge our hearts here today. Encourage us so that we may tackle our week this week in a way that's glorifying to you. Lord, you minister, I do pray, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the, um, 
the first thing we find here in this text, and I'm going to take a minute because it's only, uh, it's only um, five, little, five little verses. Let me read these verses, if I may. It says this, we, we see this in the whole context. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Here in this text, we see, we see three things that need to be, I believe, present in our lives if we're going to worship God the way he wants us to worship. Number one, we need to have the right attitude in worship. You need to have the right heart attitude as you go and worship God. Okay, what is that attitude that we find? Here we find four things. Number one, okay, and, um, and before, I go, before I do that, Proverbs 4 tells us to keep our heart with diligence. Okay, we need to make sure that we guard our hearts. Why? Because we have to have that right heart before we go to the Lord. So let's look at what the psalmist says with regards to this. Number one, we need a rejoicing heart. Notice what it says there in verse one. It says, make a joyful shout to the Lord. It's interesting, the word make a joyful shout is one word in the Hebrew. It's a command. And it says, you and I have to make a joyful shout. What is that talking about? It's talking about giving God the praise for what he has done. It's, it, it's, it carries the idea of, of I, I don't want to say yelling back to God, because I think that's, to a certain extent, disrespectful. But it's making an ear-piercing noise to God. And when, when I read that, the first thought I thought of was the children of Israel... When Moses was up, up in the mountain, remember he was up in the mountain, and, and he was, he was um, uh, you know, uh, he was coming back down, and the word of God says they heard loud voices, they heard loud cries, almost as if a battle was taking place down in the camp. Okay, what were they doing? They were worshiping what? Uh, they were worshiping the calf, remember the golden calf? They were worshiping the golden calf. Okay, and, um, and, and we, we find that, you know, the children of Israel understood what it meant to make a joyful noise or a joyful shout. They just did it to the wrong, to the wrong thing. They, they did it to a thing instead of to God. But the Word of God tells us here that we have a responsibility to make our voice heard when we praise God. I think so often, you know, and, and I know Jerry reminds us of this in the choir you know, we're singing in the choir and practicing, and he says, you know, I can barely hear you. Why? Because we're all just afraid. We're all going to sin in this way. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, make a joyful shout to God. Ear piercing. Okay, so the note's a little wrong. So the note's a little wrong. Okay. <laughs> But, you know, sing out, you know, praise God, let your voices be heard, is the, is the idea that, that the psalmist is giving us. And it's interesting, in Psalm 40, in verses 1 through 3, it says this, I waited patiently for the Lord, he, and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the, my, of the, the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock and establish my steps. I think here we could, talk, we could say that this is describing our salvation. Okay? He's taking us out, out of the, the pit, out of the, out of the clay, out of the, the pit trough that we were rolling around in, and he set us up and he's called us the children of God. He's made us kings. He's put that new robe on us, that robe of righteousness. He said, hey, I, I'm no longer going to call you, you know, uh, an enemy, but I'm going to call you my friend, and actually I'm going to call you my child. I'm going to call you an heir to the kingdom of God. That's what Romans tells us. Okay? And, and that's what it's talking about. He says, establish your step. The next verse says this. He has put a new song in my, in my mouth. Do you realize that God, because of your salvation, you have it should have a new song in your mouth? Praising God for what He has done for you. 
That is what Scripture is talking about. And I think this is exactly what the psalmist here is talking about in Psalm 100, in verse, uh, in verse number 1, where he says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you like. Okay, there's a, there's a second truth, and that is a serving heart. When we come to worship God, not only should we have a rejoicing heart, a, a heart that is going to be full of joy and, and ready to shout out this new song before the Lord, but we also should have a serving heart. Notice what verse 2 says. It says this, serve the Lord with that. Okay, this idea of serving the Lord. Here's another command. I, there, are, there are actually seven commands in this, in this five verses. There are seven commands, and there are two reasons why those commands are given. <laughs> this is command number two, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord is not just a, uh, it's just not the idea of I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to get to work. Now that's part of it, but it also carries the idea of worshiping God. It carries the idea of coming before Him. Why? Because He owns us. Because He bought us with a price. And isn't it interesting that we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20 that for you were bought at a price. What was that price? It was the body, the blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross so you and so, so I could have eternal life. And I hope you have taken advantage of that. But the Word of God says, listen, because He bought us with a price, because He gave His life for us, we in turn have this bondage um, a relationship with Him. I'm here, I'm willing to serve you, Lord. And I think that brings us to our third point. There should be a willingness of heart. Okay? It's not that we come to the Lord and, and, and you know, the Lord has our arm behind our back and He's twisting our arm and says, listen, Randy, I want you to do this. And you know something? There are times where I do something for the Lord and I'm kicking and screaming and saying, really, Lord, don't want to do this. But he says, no, I'm going to make you do this. Why? Because I know what's best for you. But you know something? God, God, God can use a heart that is not willing, but guess what? God wants a heart that is willing. Why is it that when, when Paul was talking to the church about giving, he says, God blesses a what kind of giver? A cheerful giver. Why? Because God wants a heart that is willing to say, okay, I am going to do this. Why? Because you died for me, because you, you saved me, because you loved me first. Therefore, I'm going to willingly love you, and I'm going to willingly serve you, and I'm going to willingly do you know, what I need to do. Why? Because you own me. And I'm not, I'm not this unwilling servant, but I'm the servant who's going to say, okay, Lord, I'm pleased to be here. Sort of like Isaiah did. Isaiah, when, when God said, who, who will go for us? Then I, I think, you know, maybe, maybe timidly, I, I, Isaiah put his hand up and said, I'll go, Lord. I'm willing. You know, and I think sometimes that's how we, we are, but there has to be a willingness of heart. There has to be a willingness of heart when we go to, to uh, when we come to church. You know, it doesn't what, doesn't one of the psalms say? Uh, I think it's Psalm one twenty one where it says, "You know, I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord.' There was a there was a there was a willingness, you know, to say, hey, I, I I'm excited about this.' Are you excited on Sunday morning? Do you, do you hit your alarm like me at five thirty in the morning on Sunday morning or or quarter to six and lay lay in bed thinking, I really don't want to get up this morning, Lord." Do I really have to get up? And do I have to face all those people again, Lord? No, not that. There are days I feel that way. And, and you know something? You might look at you might look at me saying that and thinking, oh, our pastor feels that way. Well, guess what? So do you at times. Okay? We do feel that way at times. And you know something? That's part of our human nature. And we have to understand that. But you know, there ought to be a willingness in our heart to say, okay, Lord, my, my, my flesh doesn't want to do it, but I don't do what the flesh wants to do. I'm going to do what the Spirit tells me to do. And I'm willing to do that, and I'm ready to do that. And, and, and out of bed I go, and after I hit the alarm clock three times, and the snooze goes off three times, I say, okay, Lord, here we go. For a long, busy day. But Lord, it's your day. And you bless me through it. And then you know, I've always found that when, 
when we are willing to do something for God, God always blesses us for it. God always blesses us. But there has to be a willing heart. And, and, and we see this in this text. Look, look what it says. I mean, I, I'm not speaking out of, out of the text. Look what it says in verse 2. It says, come before his presence with sin. The term come here has the idea of a, of a, of a, of a willingness to come on your own. It's not somebody pushing you. It's not somebody forcing you. It's not somebody who's, uh, who's, who's you, know, you know, cattle prodding you to do this. This is what you have to do. But it's, it's you saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to come because I want to do your will. And, and as I said, we don't always like the will of God, but we're willing to do what God wants us to do. Why? Because I know that if God's called me to do something, He's going to equip me and He's going to bless me as I do. My friends, there's number three, a willing heart. Again, a command, come. Okay? And then first uh, Chronicles chapter 28. I love this one. I love this verse. Look what it says. It says, as for you, my son Solomon, know that God, your father, uh, know, uh, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and a what? Willing, willing Okay, Lord, I have a loyal heart, and I have a loyal heart. Can I stop right here, right now? And I could end the message right now. But can I ask you this question? Do you today have a loyal heart? You know what that's talking about? It's talking about faithful to God. It's talking about, oh, what is it? First, First Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 2, that says... It is required of a servant to be found faithful. That's a loyal heart. Lord, Lord, I don't know where you're going to lead, but wherever you lead, I'll go. That's what Abraham said. David was willing. Lord, I'm in your hands, wherever that leads me. Noah, I, I, you know, I, I've always been amazed by Noah. Here's a man who's been told, you know, they haven't seen rain and, and, and there's, no, there's probably no oceans nearby. And, and I want you to build a boat. A what? I want you to build a boat. Okay, I guess so. Then I want you to fill it with animals. Animals? I don't even like spiders, Lord. You want me to fill it with animals? Trust me. People start mocking them. No, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to continue. Lord, the boat is finished and still hasn't rained. What's going on? What's happening? Don't worry about it. You get in the boat and you wait. But, but Lord, the sun is still shining. What's going on? No, he obeyed. He had a loyal heart. And, and I think this is what the psalmist is trying to get, to get us to understand. We have to have a joyful heart. Okay, we have to have a, a serving heart, but we also have to have a willing heart, a heart that, that is saying, okay, Lord, I will be faithful to you no matter what. The enemy is going to throw my way. And I can tell you this, that when you make a profession to God and you say, God, I'm going to do this for you, Satan's going to say, hey, let's see if you're true to your word. And he starts shoveling things towards you. And then it starts getting harder and harder and deeper and deeper. And, and, and I've seen some of you folks. And I pray, I pray for you folks on a, on a regular basis. But I know, I know, for instance, and I, I don't want to embarrass them, but I know the Teslas have gone through Satan's attacks over and over and over again. And you might say, why, why does God do, why does God allow that? Well, God allows that because He wants us to grow in Him. He wants us to trust Him. But why is it happening? Because, because Phyllis said, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I want to follow Him through the words of that. Day. And I remember that day where she got right down, right back here behind this. Um, I'm pretty sure you were baptized here. Yep. And, uh, you know, right, right here. And I took her, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Do you want to follow him? Yes, I do. And I put her under the water and I brought her back up. And Satan hasn't stopped since that day. 
But you know something? There needs to be a heart that is saying, Lord, no matter what Satan does, I'm, I have a willing heart to serve you. That's what it's about. You know, that's how we come to worship God. Okay, we, um, we find a fourth thing here in our text. Look what it says in our text. Okay, and it says, make a joyful noise in verse 1. Uh, we, need to, uh, we, we need to have a rejoicing heart. Number two, serve the Lord with gladness. We need to have a serving heart. Number three, we need to come before Him uh, with uh, His presence with singing. We need to have a willing heart. And number four, we need to have a learning heart. Look what it says there in verse three. It says, know that the Lord, He is God. Know has the idea of understanding and discerning. Has the understanding of, of taking... Um, you know, uh, of, of discovering, realizing, to find, to see. That is exactly what Paul is telling Timothy when he writes to Timothy and says, be diligent. You know, I, I put the, 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 uh, this, uh, this here study, I added to it. I don't like the New King James translation of it. I like the Old King James translation. Study to show that self I understand the word study in the King James means to be diligently working hard at doing this. Okay? But the idea here is I have to apply myself to know who God is. Because in our own minds, we don't know that. Where does wisdom come from? The beginning of wisdom starts where? A fear of God. The beginning of knowledge comes from what? Fear in God. That's what we're told in Scripture over and over again. But it says this, study or be diligent to present yourself approved unto God, a workman who, uh, who does not need to be ashamed. And then it says this, rightly dividing the word of truth. What's it talking about? It's talking about us knowing God's word well enough so that you and I can know what is, what is real and what isn't real. Because Satan's going to come up and he's going to say, ah, did he really say that? Did he really say you can't touch on the fruit of the garden in the middle of the tree, the, the tree in the middle of the garden? I, I'm sure, I'm sure that when when you do, do when you do touch it and, and eat it, I, I'm sure you'll get smarter, not die. No, no, no. What does God say? Not what man says. Man loves to interpret Scripture. But do you know something? It's not what man says, it's what God says that counts. No, and notice what, notice what the psalmist tells us right here. He says, know that the Lord, He is God. He is God. The implication of this verse, and, I, and, and we don't have time but, uh, to, uh, to, to break this down any further, but... The implication of this verse is that we have a right submission when we come into worship. The implication of that God is God, you know, I mean that, that verse there, God is Lord, and uh, or the Lord is God. Okay, the Lord is the term Jehovah, the self-existing one. Okay, He is God, the Creator of all things, is what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, listen, because of who He is, you need to be submissive to the will of God. You need to say, okay, Lord, here am I. I mean, we've talked about willingness already, and to a certain extent, some of this, but, but the, the, the point here is that we need to be willing. And why ought we be, uh, sorry, we need to be submissive. And why ought we be submissive? There's several reasons why I believe we ought to be submissive. The Word of God tells us that He is our Creator. He made all things. Notice what it says in our text, real quick, in verse 3. It says, know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and not we ourselves. How many times do we allow pride to get in the way? Look what I can do. Look what I can take care of. Look what I can, I, I can make happen. The Word of God says it's not about you, it's about God. He is the one who made all things. He is the one who sustains all things. He is the one who, and, and you, we want a verse to look that up, Colossians chapter 1, if I'm not mistaken, it's either in verse 15 or 16, maybe 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there. It talks about how Jesus Christ is the one who sustains all things, and by Him all things came to life, and all things exist by Jesus Christ. Why? Because He is God. He is God Almighty, and He is the one who can take care of all things. We need, to, uh, we need to also 
Um, and I'm going to skip our verses here. Okay, we also need to understand that he is our shepherd. He is our shepherd. Isn't that what scripture tells us? Look what it says in verse, uh, in verse 3 again. It goes on at the end of verse 3. It says, we are his people and the sheep of his pastures. If we're the sheep of his pastures, it means he is our shepherd. I love Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. As, a, as our shepherd, we follow him. He leads us. He directs us. He, 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 he ministers to us. He cares for us. And I, uh, I love, I love what, uh, what we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 6. It says this, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Why? Because He is almighty. He's all-powerful. He's the one who created you. He's the one who sustains you. He's the one who allows these things in your life. And so what do we need to do? We need to be humble ourselves. We need to submit ourselves to Him and allow His perfect will to be done in our that what? That he may exalt you in due time. He has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. I, I, don't, I don't know if you fully understand that God has a purpose for what's going on in your life right now. Pastor, I, I don't know about that. You know, I've had this surgery and, and, and it's not going the way it was supposed to go. My aunt had a, had a surgery. Her daughter, who was a nurse, said, hey, Mom, don't, don't do this. And she says, no, no, if I can have a better quality of life. She's 90, 90 91, somewhere in there. And she wanted she, the, her, her feet, her one foot, um, was not receiving blood. And uh, she had, she, they, they said they could put a stint because of the blockage in her, in her artery or in her vein going down to her foot. They could put a stint in there. Now patient surgery, and her daughter said, listen, I've seen older people um, they don't have this and have complications and mom, I don't want you to have it. She says, no, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. She said, if I can have a better quality of life and I can walk around without, you know, I'm, I'm going to do that. And surgery went perfect. Surgery went exactly the way. Two days later, I get a phone call saying Aunt Millie's in the hospital. She had an aneurysm in her leg. You know, my, uh, uh, my cousin wrote to me, my other cousin, she wrote to me and says, my sister was right. Maybe mom shouldn't have had her. No. God has a plan and a purpose for me. Why? Because God has a plan for everything. Even if it's something that you don't understand. If it's something that you, you can't comprehend. Why would God allow me to go through this? Why? Because God is sovereign and God is in control and God knows what He's doing and God knows, knows what tomorrow is going to hold. And so you trust Him. Why? Because He is our shepherd. He is the one who is the Almighty. He is the one who is God, as the Word of God says here in verse 3. He's the one who can take care of you and will take care of you and, ex and eventually will exalt you if you trust Him. Trust Him. I can go around the room here and I could probably pick out different ones in this room that are going through some hard times. And you could say, Pastor, I don't understand. I don't either. But I know that God does. So trust Him. Trust Him. That is the picture that the psalmist is giving us here. There has to be a submission to Him. You know, how do we submit? We trust. Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you for tomorrow, my tomorrow. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to allow you to have your perfect way in my life. But there's a right submission that we have to have. And then there's also a right offer. In verses 4 and 5, uh, the, we're told that we have to come into his house with the right offering. Okay? There's, uh, there, there, when we worship Him, we worship Him a certain way. The Word of God tells us we worship Him decently and in order. There's, you know, people, people ask us, ask me all the time, well, why do you do that? Why, why, why do you spend time praying? Why do you have a pastoral prayer? Why do you, do you have that? And each pastor can, <coughs> can choose to do it differently, but in my mind, prayer is part of worshiping God. Yeah. You know, in January, we're going to pass, start passing the offering basket back out. Why? Because I believe... Part of worshiping God is giving in our offering. Too many people don't see the box. There's a box in the back for your offering. 
And so often we come in and we're running late and we forget to put it in. And we're running late or we're, we're, we're in a hurry to go to, you know, to that uh, buffet, th that, that buffet, and, you know, that we're, our stomach is starting to, gr uh, to, to grumble and, and, and growl. And, and we want to get to that buffet and we run past the offering plate. And then later on in the day we say, oh, no, oh, oh, here's my offering check. I forgot to put it in. And then next week, oh, there's two of them now. Why? Because we forget there's an altar death. Giving is part of our worship to God. Okay, singing songs is part of our worship to God. Studying God's word is part of our worship to God. There is a, there's, there's the right offering that has to be given unto the Lord. And the psalmist mentions that. Look what he says in verses 4 and 5. It says this, uh, in verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and then into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless him um, and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Verse 4 gives you that statement that says why, what, what I'm supposed to do. And then in verse 5, it tells us why we're doing this offering, why we're giving to the Lord. Okay? And in, in Hebrews chapter 13, it says you know, we give Him the offering of our lips. Okay? We, we find that we need to praise the Lord. We need to give our offering of, of, of praise for His goodness. God is a good God, and I can tell you this. God has done something special for you this past week. Amen. You might say, wait, wait a minute, Pastor. This week I've been crawling out of the mire, and I've been, I, I, I've been, I've been stuck, and I've, been, I, I've had all these problems, and one thing on the top of another. But let me tell you something. No matter how bad life seems to be, there's still something good you can praise God for. Right. Because God is good. You want a verse to look up? Look up 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34, where it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Period. Okay, number two, we need to praise Him for His mercy and for His grace. You know, a lot of people get these two confused. A lot of people say, well, let's, well how would you define that? Let me give you a quick definition of each one. Mercy is God withholding what we deserve. We deserve to be judged. Why? Because the, 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 the wages of sin is death. The wages of my sin requires me to die. That's what the Word of God says. And God says, no, I'm not going to judge Randy, but I'm going to forgive him. He gives me forgiveness. He has compassion on me. He has, he has pity on me. He loves me. Okay, grace, okay, is God withholding what we, uh, sorry, um, did I put the same thing on there, didn't I? Okay, God is giving, giving us what we do not deserve. There should be a not right there. Okay, God is giving, it should be giving. Man, I really messed that one up, didn't I? God is giving us what we do not deserve. You know, we don't deserve grace. Right. But in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. He, withhold, he withholds what we deserve, punishment, and He gives us what we don't deserve, that's grace. And you know, the Word of God tells us right here in this verse, in verse, in verse 5, it tells us this, His mercy is is everlasting. Mercy and grace go, go hand in hand. It's the same, it's a, it's a one coin with two sides on it, if you could put it that way. When you talk about God's mercy, you also have to talk about His grace. And we find here that God, we, we need to praise God for His mercy and His grace. And finally, we need to praise God. We need to offer this offering up for His truth. The Word of God tells us, okay, and I don't know if I put that on there, uh, the Word of God tells us that, uh, that His Word is true. His Word would set us free. Uh, we need to understand, and this is what we're talking about here in verse 5. You know, the bottom line is this. God wants us to come and worship Him with the right heart. Why? Because He died for us. And my friends, my question to you today is, do you have that right heart you when you come to church? Oh, well, here's another Sunday. I have to go to church. I have to hurry up. I have to get dressed. I have to run, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. And we run into church, and we, you know, we, we, we get to the pew that we normally sit on, and somebody else is sitting there. Oh, they're sitting in my place. <laughs> and by the time we sit down to worship God, you know, we're just fuming inside. Or we pull into the parking lot, and there's no parking spot. Man, they took my parking spot. Let me tell you something. 
Your name is not written on any pew. Your name is not written on any parking spot. I can tell you this. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your name is written somewhere. That's in the book of life. That's what the Word of God says. But we get so frustrated and we allow these things to irritate us so much that we come into the house of the Lord with the wrong attitude. The wrong attitude. Psalm 100 helps us to understand when we do worship God, we need to come properly. There is a proper way. Why? Because He died for us. Let's close with the word prayer. Father, Lord, I do thank you for your word. I do thank you for, um, for blessing us today. And Lord, I do pray. And I ask that, Lord, you would, um, you would just bless us, especially this week as we celebrate Thanksgiving. That it would not just be another holiday with, with family, but it would be a time where, we, Lord, we can remember who you are and what you have done. And we can worship you. We can cry out with a loud voice and praise you if for nothing else but for the fact that you have saved me. Lord, help us to have that right attitude, not just on Sunday mornings, but every day of the week. I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing together this last song. It's just a little chorus. You know it. We're